good afternoon, good evening. Um, before proceeding, before moving any um, a step for, uh, further, I just want to, um, to thank Alisa Doroth and Rima Tassi, um, who do so much behind the scenes. So <laughs> it's only, we are only able to do it because of them. So thank you. So um, welcome to this session featuring Ibtisam Azam's book, The Book of Disappearance. Um, my name is Atalia Omer and I'm a professor of religion, conflict, and peace, peace studies at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame. The University of Notre Dame also hosts the literatures of annihilation, exile, and resistance, an interdisciplinary approach to the global Middle East and North Africa. This is one of the initiatives co-sponsoring this event, with the other being the Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative housed at Harvard University. I personally have the honor to be a board member of the Literatures of Annihilation, Exile, and Resistance at the University of Notre Dame and a senior fellow at the Harvard's Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative. I now will briefly introduce each initiative and our participants, and then I'll move away. <laughs> um, the uh, Literatures of Annihilation, Exile, and Resistance is a biannual symposium and lecture series that focuses on the study of literatures that have been shaped by histories of territorial and linguistic politics, colonialism, military domination, and human rights violations. The initiative grapples with the constructed nature of history, reimagines American and global history from the position of suppressed voices, and examines how minoritized writers and scholars have historically innovated, innovated literary production and theory in the process of responding to systemic violence. Literatures of Annihilation, Exile and Resistance, launched by Azarin van der Vliet Ulumi, is co-sponsored by the College of Arts and Letters, the Kiosk School of Global Affairs, and the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies, all at the University of Notre Dame. Now, the Harvard Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative is led by Professor Diane L. Moore and of, uh, of Harvard University and by Hilary Rantisi, who I will be introducing shortly. The Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative is a joint program of Harvard Divinity School and Harvard Kennedy School. The initiative examines how a more capacious understanding of religion can yield fresh insights into contemporary challenges and opportunities for, for just peace building. Centralizing an analysis of structural injustice, violence and power, and engaging deeply with narratives of belonging and displacement are at the core of this initiative. The geographic focus is on the Middle East region, specifically Palestine, Israel. The initiative highlights cultural activism and resistance work that engages with questions of historical memory, reclaiming of pasts, and reimagining futures. With this, and before turning to introduce our speakers for today, I would like to acknowledge that while we are all meeting in this weird cyberspace, I am physically at, on the campus of the University of Notre Dame, speaking to you from what is the traditional homeland of native peoples, particularly that of the Pokegan Potawatomi, who have been using this land for education for thousands of years and continue to do so. So today we have a great honor to feature the work of Ibtisam Azam, who is a Palestinian short story writer, novelist, and journalist. She studied at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and later at Freiburg University in Germany, where she earned a master's degree in Islamic studies with minors in German and English literature. She recently finished another MA in social work from NYU Silver School. She works as a senior correspondent covering the United Nations for the Arabic daily Al Arabi Al Jadid. She is also co editor at Jadalia Izain. She has published two novels in Arabic, The Sleep Thieves, Haifawi, 
uh, that was published in 2010, and The Book of Disappearance, uh, which will be discussed today, and it was published in Arabic in 2014. It was translated into English by Sinan Antun, who I, I believe is on the, this uh, meeting. Uh, and it was published by Syrac Syracuse University Press um, in July 2019. It was chosen as the 2020 title for librarians and archivists with Palestine's international reading campaign, titled One Book, Many Communities. Excerpts of Azam's writing have been published in French, German, English, Dutch, and Hebrew, and have appeared in several anthologies and journals. She is working on, an, on a collection of short stories right now, entitled The Women Who Walk to the End of the World. The conversation will feature the discussant Hilary Rantisi, who is the Associate Director of the Religion, Conflict and Peace Initiative at Harvard University, where she is also a Senior Fellow at the Religious Literacy Project. Previously, she was the Director of the Middle East Initiative at Harvard Kennedy School of Government. She received her master's degree in Middle Eastern Studies from the University of Chicago. Prior to joining Harvard, she worked with civil society organizations in Palestine, Israel, which focus on religion, politics, and grassroots mobilization efforts in Jerusalem. She co-edited Our Story, The Palestinians, which was published in 1999, and has been an active public speaker on issues pertaining to the Middle East region. Hillary is a native Arabic speaker. She is a Palestinian from Lidda, a site of a massacre during the days of the Nakba or the catastrophe of 1948. Hillary grew up in Ramallah, but she's always and forever from Lidda. The event will be moderated by Notre Dame MFA alumna, Nazli Koka, who is an Anglophone writer who grew up on the Mediterranean coast of Turkey. Her work has appeared in the Three Penny Review, Books Without Covers, and elsewhere. She currently lives in the US, where she continues to write about exile, the disorientation, and isolation. With this, I conclude the introductions and I'm eager to listen to the readings from the profoundly tragic book of disappearance. Ibtisam, um, the proverbial stage is yours now. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Atalia. Uh, thanks uh, for, for your words and the great introduction. And thanks for Lisa and uh, Azarine for, 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 and Hillary and Nazali, but Azarine for, for initiating all of this and for the great work you do. Um, and of course, for the University of Notre Dame and Harvard. So I will start by reading um, a short part in Arabic and then uh, move to a longer in English. Uh, so for those who didn't read the novel, the novel, as probably you read about it, read about it, it uh, takes place within about 48 hours after the Palestinians uh, disappear. Uh, and uh, it, it has different chapters. One of um, uh, the main characters is a Palestinian, his name is Ala. And uh, we uh, get her vo his voice through uh, memoirs that his Israeli neighbor uh, find. They live in the same building. So all the parts I'm going to read are actually from Ala's memoir, uh, the ones he writes to his uh, grandmother. Uh, so I will just go now for reading. قلت لي إنك كنتي تمشينا في الشارع مع والدك وتضحكينا بصوت عالٍ. والأسلاك الشائكة من حولكم لأكثر من عشرة أعوام لا خروج من العجم إلا بتصاريح وحتى اسم يافا استولوا عليه عندما وضعوها تحت وصاية تل أبيب ألهذا لا أحب تل أبيب؟ هل ورثت أنا هذه الغصة في القلب عنك؟ ولماذا أسكن فيها؟ وليش ما تسكن فيها؟ هاي فلسطين هاي قرى يافا وتضلها إلنا قلت ثم سكت وكأن الكلام أصبح فعل ألم قلت إنك خرجت مع والدك في ساعة لا يمكن إلا أن توصف بأنها ساعة من الجنون كنت تمشين معه وتلقين التحية, وتلقين التحية على الغرباء لكي توهميه أن ما يقوله صحيح وأن الناس جميعا عادوا إلى يافا قلت لي إنك إن والدك خرف 
وراء الناس كلهم هناك عشر سنوات لم يتمكن خلالها من التعود على يافاه الجديدة وهل يمكن أن يتعود الإنسان على نكبته؟ وبدلوا أسماء الشوارع بأرقام كأنه معتقل بل هو معتقل بدلوا أسماء الشوارع بأرقام ليذكروكم أنكم في معتقل اسمه يافا وكأنكم كنتم تحتاجون لمن يذكركم I am mad at you. Your memory, which is engraved in my mind, has all these holes in it. Am I not remembering all that you told me? Or was it incomprehensible? I was very young when I started listening to your stories. Later, when I turned to them for help, I discovered these holes. I started to ask you about them. But the more I asked, the more you got mixed up. Or maybe I did. How would things not get mixed up? I was certain that there was another city on top of the one we live in, donning it. I was certain that your city, the one you kept talking about, which has the same name, has nothing to do with my city. It resembles it a great deal. The names, orange, groves. Okay, so where do all these names come from? We would be walking and you start mentioning other names too, names not written on signs. I had to learn to see what you were seeing. Ah, and all those people, I got to know all their problems and how they were forced to leave Jaffa. I know all the boring and at the time interesting details about their lives. I knew all the jokes they used to tell, all this without having even met a single one of them. And I probably never will. Your Jaffa resembles mine, but it's not the same. Two cities impersonating each other. You carved your names in my city, so I feel like I am a returnee from history, always tired, roaming my own life like a ghost. Yes, I'm a ghost who lives in your city. You too are a ghost living in my city, and we call both cities Jaffa. You were the exact opposite of the others. They couldn't take, they couldn't talk about their catastrophes when they, when they take place. Even they dare open, even if they dare open the gate of memory, they would do it just a bit and years later. You were the opposite. The last time I asked you about how they kicked you out of al Manshiyi, forced you to go to Ajami, and how you lived with the Hungarian family they brought to share your house with, you, you said, um, my tongue is worn away from words. Don't ask me anymore. They didn't stay long in the house we were forced to go to. We were lucky. That's enough, grandson. What good will it do to talk about it? Even words are tired. You used to say that you would walk in the morning but could not recognize the city or the streets as if they too were expelled along with those who were forced to leave. Back then, my child eyes tried to imagine the scene. Back then, my child eyes tried to imagine the scene the way you describe it, as if the darkness had swallowed them. And, and the sea took them hostage. That is how you describe your days and those people who were forced to leave and go beyond the sea. But you didn't say that the population of the city went from 100,000 down to 4,000. No, you didn't say that. You didn't say that you couldn't recognize your city after they had left. My mind cannot process my mind cannot process these figures, nor can I comprehend what it means for a city to lose most of its people. I, who was born and raised in Jaffa, after Jaffa had left itself.
Yesterday marked 20 days since the bombing. Yesterday marked 20 days since they bombed Gaza. That was I initially wanted to say, but didn't want to start with it. They were pulling corpses out of the rubble as if they were dolls. They pull, but the corpses refused to come out of their debris. They were covered with dust and blood. I had a strange urge to go and wipe the dust off myself. Maybe because I wanted to see the faces clearly. I say bombed Gaza and not declared war in, on Gaza. Because war sounds lighter. War was a big word when I was young. But I grew bigger and it grew smaller. There are so many wars around us. We have gotten used to them. I never experienced bombing, and that's why I always see it always seemed that's why it always seemed severe and hard. There is no absurd there is an absurd repetition in bombing. When we were kids, we used to play war started in. We used to draw a circle and divide it according to the number of players. We gave each part the name of a country. We would often choose names like Lebanon, Palestine, Iraq, and Egypt. No one ever, no one ever chose Saudi Arabia or Morocco. One of us would then hold a branch and say, the war started in Lebanon. And then throw the branch away from the person who chose the name of that country. And that person would have to catch the others. I hated that game. Not because it involved war, but because I never liked running after someone and catching them. I did use to play it too. Did you use to play it too? I don't remember that someone taught me how to play it or any other or any other game, as if these games grew up with me. What types of games did you play when you were a kid? I don't remember you telling us much about your childhood, except a few sentences in passing. How come I never realized that before? Weren't you a child once? You were a youth, a young woman, a wife, a mother, a grandmother, a seamstress, but you were never a child. Forget about games and childhood, and let's go back to bombing. As I mentioned, they bombed Gaza. They bombed them with airplanes and bombs. And, and what else? My heart is numb. Maybe my heart has withered, and the heart of those they bombed have become numb. I looked for you, I looked for you yesterday. I went out to the streets, the sea, and to that spot where I found you. I stood there for a while, hoping that something would pass by, indicating that there is a life after death. But you weren't there. How can I say what I want to say to you? father he's he's gone as well yes he left three days ago my mother called me in the morning crying you have to come your father is very sick i took a taxi and went home dr abed the one you called a chatterbox was there baba is gone tata he died before I got to know him well. The truth is, he committed suicide. But we didn't tell anyone because suicide is shameful. We didn't tell anyone. His death seemed normal after all these days of bombing Gaza. I looked for you and didn't find you. I wanted to tell you that they bombed Gaza and that Baba committed suicide. I went to, towards the Al-Bahar Mosque and couldn't find you. I didn't find you. 
Baba committed suicide and they bombed Gaza for the 20th day. Baba's suicide was trivial after all these days of them bombing Gaza. Do we have two, three minutes more for the last part or should we stop here? Okay. Um, when I walk the city, when I walk the city's streets, I touch its houses with my looks. I hear myself screaming out loud, as if a clear glass separates me from the people around me. Glass that chills sounds. I rarely see it, but I know that it is there when I scream and no one hears me. I sit in the middle of the boulevard. Yes, Rothschild is a boulevard and not a street. I don't know why I call it street. I sit on the wooden bench that sit together with trees in the middle of the street. Waiting and I sit together. I don't know what I'm waiting for, but I'm waiting for something. Sometimes I never dream, I, sometimes I even dream that I'm, wa I'm sitting and waiting. What? I dream that I'm, sit I'm sitting and waiting. What a silly dream. When evening creeps in, the lights of houses and cafes around me appear and I wait. That's not a dream. That's what I actually do as I sit on the bench that are surrounded with giant trees in the median, as if the buildings around me from which lights and shadows appear are also waiting for something or someone. Everything is beautiful from the vantage point of the bench. As soon as night falls, I begin to wash the houses around me with black memory. I wipe the whiteness of the facades of buildings and paint everything black. I take black from the night's kohol and draw the city black as if I am afraid that the white memory will possess me. So I wipe it with the blackness of a moonless night. I love the color black because it resembles us. It is us. Sometimes I, I leap out of the bench like a clock spring and walk in stammering steps to the sea. I see nothing around me because I have colored all the houses with black. Even the moon is black. I often go through Schenken Street. I, uh, I greet people sitting at cafe shops. They smile and call me, Ala, come sit with us. Let's chat and have a glass of wine. Tell us about Yafa and your Yafa and grandmother. Come on. I imagine them being genuinely interested and asking what never crosses their mind. How do we feel? How do we live? But questions no longer have any meaning. I leave them without responding. I no longer care to tell them anything. Everyone welcomes me. They all want to hear my stories and yours. Yes, your stories. My stories are fushers of your stories. The ones you told me and the ones you never did. I pay them no attention and go on. I leave Schinken Street and pass through the small streets of Al-Karmel market until I reach the sea. This is not a dream. I do this time and again. I imagine and hear people saying what they say. I imagine that I paint everything around me black and see no other color. Black is beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, it was maybe long. <laughs> Hilary, did you want to um, 
share your response with us now? Sure. Um, first, I wanted to thank everyone. I want to thank the organizers, uh, Azarin, Natalia, Lisa, Nazli, and the partnership with Notre Dame University. A huge thank you, of course, to Tissam for her book and for sharing it with us and uh, for being with us today. Well, here is my copy of the book. Uh, you can't see here, but it's very well marked. <laughs> and I um, don't worry, I won't go through all my comments. <laughs> there are way too many. But I thought I'd just share a few of my thoughts. Um, the lens through which I read this book um, was primarily as a Palestinian, as someone who grew up in Ramallah in the West Bank but as also, as Italia mentioned, as someone from Lid, as well as Gaza and Jerusalem. Uh, although right now I don't have access to these places. I only have access to the West Bank. This is really important uh, to, to highlight because this book, the Book of Disappearance, spotlights the Palestinian experience of Palestinian citizens of Israel. One that's not um, a focus of many literary works, but is absolutely critical. Um, I found the book to be beautiful, deeply familiar, painful and violent, disturbing, but also somewhat hopeful. The beautiful relationship between Ala, one of the main characters of the novel, and his grandmother, carry us through the novel. Alat's inheritance is the memories that she shared with him of Jaffa and the Palestine before it had been disfigured, depopulated, and colonized. Um, I found the novel deeply familiar in its description of the engraved memory that becomes part of your identity and the vividness with which you see, you know where you are from, even if you've never been there. Although I grew up in Amala, a lid of my ancestors was vivid for me. It became part of me just as the experience of my grandparents, my father's uncles and aunts' displacement, and their uprooting from their home in Elid on the 12th of July in 1948, became part, became engraved in my memory. My knowledge and my memory of Elid is that of 1948 and before 1948. I inherited it, and it is etched in my being. I live with it, but I don't have the added pain of living in the contemporary lit. One that is un unrecognizable in my memory. The book of disappearance painfully shows us what that is like for Ala and his grandmother. Ala talks about how the Jaffa he grew up with was a Jaffa of fear, poverty, ignorance, and racism. And his grandmother talks about how all who remained were orphaned in their own home. As Ibtissam just shared in her first excerpt, where Ala is telling his grandmother that he's a ghost living in her city and she's a ghost living in his. That he was born in Jaffa after Jaffa had left itself. In another chapter, he talks about how he feels when he is walking, that he is walking on corpses. Such, such powerful imagery that give texture to the layers and layers of loss, pain, and displacement. The imagery continues with Alat's questioning whether Israelis would hear him if he were to scream whether they actually see him for who he is. He's able to see multiple layers, to engage with a new Tel Aviv, with an Israeli population, 
fluent in Hebrew, but this population doesn't see his pain, doesn't acknowledge the destruction it has wrought on him. And yet he has to function within it. He lives and relives the pain that others don't see. The continual and multiple levels of dispossession and loss make his heart numb, just as Tissam shared in the excerpt about Gaza. His heart is numb. That is what I refer to as disenfranchised grief. Grief that is born of injustice, that is unrecognized by the world. Grief that has multiplied that it doesn't allow time for sadness and pain. I've talked about the beauty, the pain, the violence, the deep familiarity with the themes of the novel, but at the heart of it is the powerful and deeply disturbing disappearance act of the Palestinians. The most disturbing aspect of it was the ease with which it happens, the ease with which the settler appropriation of land and possessions of Palestinians continues with no remorse, consequence, or feeling. A pivotal character in the novel is Ariel. So Ariel is Alat's friend. He's a Jewish Israeli neighbor and a self-described leftist. Ariel discovers Alat's diary when Alat disappears and searches it for clues, um, for clues around his and the other Palestinians' disappearance. He, he wants to find out more if there's anything in this diary. One would assume that Alat's diary would evoke Ariel's empathy. Yet he doesn't seem capable of it or of seeing Alat fully. He easily normalizes the disappearance of his friend is willing to participate in the appropriation of Palestinian memory and is eager to take over Alat's apartment and possessions as soon as his country makes it legal, which is just 48 hours after they disappear. A repetition of the Nakba and continuing the erasure that is at the heart of settler colonialism. I have a lot more to say but need to end and feel that I need to share some hope I saw in the characters. The last chapter in Alat's diary alludes to hope. I'll read some excerpts of Alat's writing to his grandmother. So, here it is. I sit down and missed you, but today, for the first time, I smiled when I was missing you, only because I remembered why I love you more than, I, than anyone else. Do you know why? Because you loved life and never lost hope. You learned to love Jaffa even when it was cruel and taught me and you taught me that love. You are alone in Jaffa, but you loved it. Like you loved a man madly, you wouldn't stop loving it no matter what. And then he continues. I don't know why I feel so happy today, as if I've rediscovered Jaffa or learned to love it again. I walk and see its beauty. I don't forget you, but I see its beauty. I don't forget its memory, but nevertheless, I see its beauty. I remembered that sentence you repeated off so often. Oh my, Jaffa is so beautiful and Palestine is so beautiful, very beautiful. And it's not lost. That year is gone. But we, we are still here, grandson. Look how beautiful these jasmines are. Rights are never lost as long as one demands them. Alat responds, I hope you're right. Who knows? But yes, Jaffa is so beautiful. Thank you, Tissam. Thank you, Hilary, and thank you, Ibtisam. Both of your readings uh, were so beautiful. Um, I'm really happy that other people get to um, hear your voice when you talk about these things, because um, 
I am still starstruck uh, from reading Gipta Sam's novel and our previous conversation. I prepared three questions um, for Ibtisam, and I will ask Hillary to respond to the third question as well after Ibtisam. And then we will open the discussion to questions from you, the audience. But if you have any questions before that time, please feel free to um, write them either privately to me or uh, to everyone through the chat. So my first question is um, about territories. The Book of Disappearance is set in a world where the music of Fyros and Korsakov, Bauhaus and Ottoman architecture and other forms of Eastern and Western art lay out the mandates of both reality and imagination. As someone who's lived in the East and West, different parts of Israel and the world, and studied Western literature, what are the main differences in arts between the two sides of the spectrum? And what do these differences mean to you, Ibtisam, and to Ariel in the novel, to Allah, to the novel and to the world. What happens to Eastern art when it's um, translated to the West and vice versa? Can you tell us about the different ways in which your work, The Book of Disappearance in particular, has been received in different languages once it's crossed different territories? Thank you, thank you, Nazli, and thank you, Hilary, for a really uh, very uh, touching uh, uh, commentary and uh, uh, really thanks. Uh, so I, I uh, we start by uh, the, 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 the last part you talked about. Um, oh, oh, let me start by, by uh, something uh, that Hillary talked about that she, uh, which connects to, to, to part of your questions. Uh, and uh, where is my note? <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so the, the issue of the, the loneliness of Palestinian citizens of Israel and even in general also of many Palestinians, uh, but in that per, uh, particular part of the world and um, when when people like uh, Hillary, who also Palestinians and uh, lived in Ramallah or um, in other places, or other Palestinians who are not allowed to to to, to enter even uh, a historic Palestine or any part of it, uh, re read the book and tell me that um, it resonates. It's it's it was part of their history or part of their story. Um, that is one of the things I get uh, often with the Arabic readers or um, even Palestinians who don't who speak Arabic but didn't grow up in Palestine uh, or in the Arab world and speak maybe more um, uh, spoken Arabic and uh, not uh, necessarily read in English in Arabic and they read the novel in English. So, and it means a lot because at the end of the day, I am, I write uh, about home or uh, about exile uh, at home, kind of exile. Um, and in Arabic for, for, for Palestinians, of course, for international uh, audience, for Arab readers, but this is my, the people I write for and uh, maybe my first um, who I want to talk to. Uh, going back to, 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 to the part about translation and um, Arabic literature into Western uh, languages. So there are First of all, if we look at the translation map in, in, in North America, there's very little percentage of translated literature uh, into English uh, in American published in American published houses. If you compare that uh, um, um, to Europe, to France or Germany or any countries, uh, any other country. And the percentage of literature from Arabic that translated is really uh, very, uh, not that large. And then on top of that, 
uh, we go to the issue uh, of um, um, how this translated literature is looked at. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times it is treated as um, uh, anthropology. It's uh, there is not much comments all uh, about the artistic or the creative part of the novels or the artwork, etc. So that makes things sometimes frustrating. It doesn't mean that um, people shouldn't talk about politics, of course they should, but it is not always treated as uh, literary work. And also there is the issue of who get translated and where it gets published. Uh, many novels, uh, and in my case, uh, it is very difficult to get published in, uh, especially in the United States, maybe in Europe, it's different, uh, in um, main publishing houses, especially if it's translated literature. Uh, usually, uh, uh, university presses will play a very important role here uh, to uh, um, um, translating literature from Arabic and other languages, from the global south, uh, but in specific in Arabic. If you compare that to uh, um, what is being translated, for example, uh, in, uh, from Hebrew, from Israel in one year to what is being translated in the United States, to what is being translated from 20 or more than 20 Arab countries, the, the numbers are really uh, telling. Uh, and talk about literature. So you also, uh, as for the work, it how it was uh, received in uh, different languages. That's a very interesting question. You know, um, we sometimes make the mistake to, to assume that the language is one culture, but it's not. So there are so many cultures within the Arab culture, and then. Uh, there is a problem when you, uh, it, it's a, um, it's something good, but it's also a curse. Uh, when you write about a place like Palestine or Israel or these places that are so much on the uh, spot, spotlight and the focus, because many people within the Arab world and in the Western world or in many places, they have their emotions and opinions, very strong ones about uh, Palestine and sometimes uh, what, what I uh, feel that uh, they uh, look in the novel or in the work uh, to re um, or to find their own views and they forget sometimes to look at uh, as I said before the literature value of the work, like it or dislike it. You can politically agree with somebody and uh, or disagree, but you find their work is just good, uh, at least from uh, a literary perspective. But I was uh, very touched when, like for example, when I met people, I, I had a reading in Canada in Toronto about a year ago and people who uh, were not from the Arab, uh, world. Uh, somebody from Kashmir came and said that that the work for, spoke to him uh, in a very personal way. Uh, it is different, of course, Kashmir and Palestine and each place is different, but it was for him, reminded him from home, of home in a way or another. Um, uh, so that's, that's, that says a lot. It also reminds me of what I myself go through when I read literature from other culture, when I read literature of African American writers, or uh, um, or any or, or many other cultures that spoke to me and did influence me too, uh, I will stop here. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I saw that uh, we got one question from the audience that um, we can expand on um, after the two questions. So um, my second question is um, changing the subject a little bit. Um, but I'm curious, what were the things that are the hardest for you to write 
um, about in this novel and in your writing career in general. As a woman writer, as a Middle Eastern writer, uh, how do you overcome the self-censorship which we have the teachings of state oppression and patriarchal norms to thank for in order to make your characters say and think the things they do? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I will take you uh, back to, if I start with the issue of the censorship. Censorship is really, uh, <laughs> it's an interesting uh, theme. I think I was uh, lucky uh, that I um, decided that I published my first novel when I was uh, after 30. Uh, and I think that helped me in a way to, uh, it was uh, about 10 years ago or more than 10, yeah, 10 years ago. Uh, and I was back then already uh, established uh, professionally in life. I had a lot of uh, uh, battles behind me, social and uh, political. So that meant that I was also more um, secure about uh, what to write and not, not to care about censorship, if you want. And I had the privilege also back then to be living, not anymore living uh, home. So I was also, and it, it's also a sad thing. It's not always privilege. Uh, I, of course, go every year back to visit my family and but it, it the, the, the good side uh, or the positive side uh, of it is that you gain distance and with that you have a little bit more space or place to uh, to look at things from a little bit from the outside although you are never really in the outside uh, and then um, I still decided for the, my first novel, the the Gharib um, Hifawi, the Sleep Thief, Gharib Hifawi. I decided uh, to 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 avoid the censorship thing, or that people or family come uh, uh, tell uh, that they come and tell me, oh why, uh, oh I can't recognize this character or that character or uh, wherever. So I didn't tell anyone from my family that I was publishing a novel, and I published it in Arabic. It came out in Beirut, uh, and then I think there was an uh, article about it. I put it on uh, social media or something, and I think my uh, my sister said to me, "Oh, the, what is is this something you wrote or about you? I'm not. I don't understand." <laughs> I said, "No, actually, that's my novel. <laughs> I wrote a novel, and that was for me in a way to." Uh, but, but as I said, it was realizing that I have also the privilege of not living there anymore. And I just, and it was published anyway in Beirut. And then it was out. So <laughs> what can you do now? Uh, and actually they uh, did, uh, those who read it liked it, but of course always said, um, oh, that's not, uh, you know, people tend to think that the characters are uh, autobiographic or biographic. Uh, but also, I think one of the the problems we uh, have uh, is to try, um, I mean, I feel as a writer, there is the pressure that on the one hand you want to be read and successful, etc. But at the end of the day, uh, I do tell myself, I want to have something outside there, out there that uh, um, that doesn't take necessarily only into consideration the, or it doesn't take the, 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 um, the market issue uh, or is it going to be um, in consideration as the first thing. It is important for me that, and I can do that because probably I'm not living from creative writing because I'm a journalist and I have my job, etc. And that these are things where, um, for me at least, they help me to uh, get uh, through this censorship. And to be honest also with you, I usually, even although I write in Arabic, 
I tell myself I have to write my texts the way I like them, the way I think they are the best uh, uh, to uh, produce, to write, to, uh, and I don't have um, a specific reader in mind. Uh, that doesn't mean uh, you still write in a language, you still write within a culture. Um, but um, uh, usually very at the very end where I start like maybe editing things and taking things more into consideration, ha some reactions, uh, but in general, yeah. Uh, I want also to the issue of um, uh, uh, I wrote a note here to what you said before. Uh, the issue also of West and East that you mentioned before, and I'm thinking like it is important to try also sometimes not to think um, in these categories because when we say like Arab culture or Palestinian culture or American culture, about which culture are we actually talking? Is it the African American culture? Is it the native? Is it the white? Is it the middle class? Is it the poor? These are all like if we talk about America and the same with Palestine, there are a lot of cultures within what culture. And uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I sorry, I tend sometimes to have longer uh, answers, I will promise to make it shorter. <laughs> No, that was great. Thank you, Ibtissam. So my last question is about torture. Um, it's not uncommon to talk about torture and even sexual violence when we talk about state violence. Disappearance is perhaps the most brutal form of state violence. And for the ones who are left behind, it's a form of torture. Um, and it's the hardest to talk about, from the disappeared bodies of political activists across the globe, from Chile to Palestine, to the disappearance of peoples, of lands, and their languages in America. Can you expand on the resistance to the erasure of language and of literature as a driving force in your writing? Um, the, the body issue and the, 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 the disappearance, it has, of course, um, uh, many layers, but uh, I think one of them is also the issue of um, uh, feeling uh, suffocated in, in a place like uh, Palestine, like ha Hillary was talking about before, um, how do you live in your own homeland um, where everything uh, around you reminds you of uh, that you are uh, under uh, colonialization? Um, and the body is you we see if you if you look at politics um for example uh there are now about 60 um Palestinian bodies that the israelis refuse to release or give back to their families and some of these uh, uh many of them most of them are killed uh in the last few months or weeks and uh, and it's there sometimes they force the families like they they say to the family that they're not allowed to talk to press that they are they have to bury their uh, children uh, at night etc etc so one of the the issue this is one thing where you think there is another thing uh the issue like checkpoints. There is a lot of violence on checkpoints that you don't um, see uh, only. I mean, I'm not talking about uh, shooting. I'm talking about this waiting and the hours of waiting and waiting and the, the feeling that your body, that you is always, not only attacked, but uh, uh, that you are kind of, for whatever reason that you don't know, just because your body is a passing in body, is a, a threat. We see it here, of course, 
different history, different uh, um, circumstances with uh, African Americans, uh, etc. So that was very important. And also in in leaving the airport, I go every year, sometimes twice a year, to to visit my family. I have been living abroad for twenty more than twenty years. I cannot recall one single, maybe one time that I didn't go through a body search where you have, where you are stripped of your club, you are in a, now they do it with the machines, but until for maybe four years ago, five years ago, you're in this super small place, space with another woman, uh, you have only your uh, underwear she, still you are almost naked and she still goes with a machine over your body and you think like what is in this body that is so explosive you think that you have even to to rem and there is the technology there that they can do this they don't need to do this uh, but i think there is this psychological torture if you want and it comes with microaggressions, with so many small details. Uh, and I think last point, I think literature for me at least is a way of writing a, an alternative uh, uh, history uh, in a way, a socioeconomic history of a place uh, that I know. And I, when I went to schools, I, uh, in the official books, history books, and even uh, uh, I didn't read uh, uh, or learn about. That's it. I'll stop here. <clears throat> Thank you again, Tessa. So to continue with the questions from the audience, can you tell us um, about how your book was received by Jewish Israelis? Uh, I don't know because it's not uh, in Hebrew, so uh, yet. Okay, um, and the other question is, why do you think so little Arabic literature is translated into other, lang other languages? I mean, it, uh, it is translated in, in uh, uh, probably more in French, German, other uh, European languages and in Britain too, in English, of course, but in America in general, that's something that American publishers have to ask themselves actually, because translation in general uh, in the United States, uh, the percentage of uh, translated literature uh, that published in the US compared to other countries is very um, uh, low. I think maybe part of it that uh, literature from the global south, maybe, and from our area specifically, uh, and art, uh, etc., is not seen as something um, of maybe interest. I, I don't know. It's, it's a good question, actually. It's a very good question, given also the fact that this country is involved in so many wars in the Middle East and you would think that there will be more interest uh, and I don't know if there is a gap between what people really want to read and what the publishing houses are doing. Maybe Thank somebody you. else can, can, can answer that question better. Yeah, I was also um, wondering if Hillary wanted to answer um, both my last question and the other questions that were asked from the audience. So if you wanted to jump in here, then we can continue uh, for specific questions for Ibtisa. Yeah, I mean, I, I really can't talk much about um, translation and literature. Um, but I think, you know, the themes in, in the novel are, as I described, they're so familiar for Palestinians, but I think as we think about what's happening there, it's, it's, it's violence and it's violence in so many forms. Um, in my work, we talk about different forms of violence, some that are visible 
uh, that that people think about the direct violence when someone is there's it's violence it's noticeable but there's structural violence there's cultural violence there's symbolic violence there's a violence of knowledge making you know um, who controls what you know what you see when you when 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 a culture is being erased when a, uh, a any presence like in in the novel you have the streets that have been renamed we have a, a stories every day today i read a story about um uh street signs that have arabic on it and um that are being erased the arabic is being erased so even even uh, the the presence of the arab language the native population that that lived there the their access to um i mean in in israel there was a law a few years ago that they tried that now has been overturned that palestinians can't um, go and pick herbs uh, zatar, um, thyme so that they can make the main that one of the a, a staple that we eat all the time uh, so even uh, that is erasure er erasure of 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 uh, of your identity is all violent uh, we may just think of violence as physical violence but violence is 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 uh, can take many forms and can eat at you and and i think the 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 novel shows these various levels of violence the the and 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 the grief that is not seen the pain that is inflicted um uh, in israel right now there's a law that doesn't allow uh the teaching of about the Nakba and what happened to Palestinians in 1948. So, you know, that itself is so fundamental. Um, and it explains why, you know, just that history itself is so dangerous, knowing what happened there. But the people who, the native population who remain there, it's 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 they take it upon themselves to keep that memory alive um and so um i guess i guess i would just kind of bring more awareness to how violence takes so many different forms and um it's it's it seeps into a culture and allows racism to continue um and and uh so there's so much undoing that needs to to happen and um whether it's in language whether it's in structures um in in many forms but i i don't really have much more to add but i i think that there are very powerful themes throughout that um were in the book that 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 raise these issues that are very very real to palestinians if I can add just uh, uh, an ad additional thing to, to what Heller said and, uh, and to, to the issue of uh, literature, I think also literature is a very, um, I mean, if you he hear a lecture or read a historic book or you can agree or disagree with the theories, you can agree with the, uh, some issues, the analysis, but in literature, it could also go under your skin if you like it. It could have more influence. It also brings the, 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 the things you hear outside more uh, into um, your inner world. And that's how a very powerful, uh, that, that's a, it's a very powerful tool too. Uh, and um, because Suddenly, uh, the Palestinians or any other uh, other uh, group of people that you usually don't hear much about uh, um, or read much from uh, their literature, they become uh, flesh and blood. They become humans, characters, people. They are not anymore a news uh, uh, 
um, two minute segment if they are lucky <laughs> and if they are at all uh, uh, um, featured. Uh, so it, it has a different power and dimension that can go deeper into understanding what is happening uh, in places and uh, yeah. Thank you, Tizam. Um, I definitely agree and that's why these, these reading series are so important. Um, on that note, Azarin uh, has a question um, that she wants to ask herself. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Ibtissam and Hillary, for just these beautiful talks and Nosli for your great questions. I, I, I guess I've been thinking a lot about the fact, like we've been talking about why th certain things get and others don't and different kinds of censorship. And I think that there is a lot that the publishing industry um, responds to whatever is being the media, right? That there's a really high correlation. And I think that there is a gag order in the media doesn't really allow um, Middle Eastern history to be um, expressed, right? Through the voices of Iranians or Iranians or Lebanese. Um, it's a very particular viewpoint that's that gets um, a lot of airtime and a lot of the literature that you know, isn't being translated, and as well as the literature that is being translated, right, is challenging that um, worldview in really critical ways. So it's not surprising that it's an uphill battle and um, that we don't even, you know, like universities are doing a good job of, of publishing some Arabic literature or Iranian literature in translation, but we're still not teaching a lot of classes on Arab literature, Iranian literature, or Arab and Iranian American literature, right, which is has a huge tradition um, and is part of the. Um, well, while we wait for Ezrin to return, um, Sefane, if you wanted to respond uh, or ask your question. Thank you so much. I actually have a comment and then kind of a question that I. Uh, or maybe a comment that if the psalm can extend upon. I want to thank you, um, and if the psalm and Hillary and Azarin for like making this this happen in the first place. Um, you asked something about like literature. The, the, one of the questions was about how there is little Arabic literature published in North America, and um, I know that again, as if the psalm says, it's really hard to you know define what is. What do we mean by uh, West and what do we mean by Middle East and all that? But um, just for the sake of the argument, I want to say it kind of has to do, this has kind of to do with that. Uh, because if you are a Palestinian writer, you are seen as a Palestinian by the publisher before you're seen as a writer who has something to say. So if they've published, I don't know, a, a novel by a Palestinian writer two years ago, they feel like, oh, well, you know, we, we've already done that this year, or, 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 or we've already done that recently. And, you, you, and the artist is not seen in that way. I, I read an interview a while back by, by an Iranian uh, writer, and uh, I don't remember their name, but I remember them saying that they took a book to, to a um, publisher and it was about their, their experiences of growing up in Iran. And it wasn't as dismal and terrible as the publisher expected. So they said, well, this is very interesting, but we're, we're, we're interested more in the plight of the Iranian woman. So they're interested in those things. If you have a narrative to say that is not completely in line with the, whatever that major narrative is, for instance, in Palestinian-Israeli conflict, what the expected narrative is, then it's harder to, to, uh, for the publishers to accept it. And, and we have to accept we are being marginalized. And as I mean, referred to like literature, uh, Iranian American literature, one of the things I mean for myself as a teacher of literature is it's interesting how uh, I, I consider, for instance, uh, Iranian American literature or Arab American literature as its own distinct diaspora literature, which has the themes and things can be different from the literature that is published in those countries or written in, in the languages other than English. But we also, one of the things I see we do is that often in the universities, we teach 
we teach them as representative of the literature from that language. For instance, when I say, I, le I teach um, Middle Eastern women's literature, or I teach Iranian literature, people say, oh, like reading Lolita in Tehran. Reading Lolita Tehran in Tehran is not Persian literature. Uh, it, it, it's diaspora literature, it, it, it's different. Now, that being said, um, my question is, um, so I'm teaching, currently I'm teaching the book of disappearance and my students, re we've worked, we've read it for one week and we, um, next week we're gonna follow up and continue. Uh, one of the things that the students brought up and I found interesting, and maybe you can speak to that, was that for them, it's in, they, they, a lot of them said they didn't realize that Allah was a guy until like farther back when the grandma started talking about why don't you get married and stuff like that. And they saw Allah as a, as a gender neutral character. Cause I, I sometimes give them this exercise to think what, what kind of conversation they would have with a character in the novel or to switch the genders of the characters in the novel and see what will happen. And I found it interesting, like I, I, wondered, I wondered if this is intentional, that they saw this, they said, okay, if Allah was a girl, things wouldn't have been different. Like the, 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 the story, the connection with the grandmother and everything. And I, just, I was just wondering if you could uh, speak to that a little bit. Thank you so much. Like if, if that matters, if gender at all mattered for you in, in the novel. You know, uh, no, thank you so much for uh, your comment and for uh, that question. It's actually a very interesting question. Uh, yes, it does matter and it doesn't also. <laughs> and in a way, um, so when, okay, so we, it has to do with also who Allah is. Allah is uh, somebody in his uh, uh, late 40s, um, beginning of 50s, uh, and he is more of, um, um, he wouldn't call himself feminist, but he does believe in feminist values. So, so his character, so he will be able more maybe to talk about his emotions, what you will assume sometimes that uh, a conservative, a character with conservative views will not do it, which is not true, of course, because they, they, they can and they do it. But uh, as a writer, I do sometimes um, I try to um, make the, the, I do think about these issues. Uh, I did not make it uh, specifically in purpose that it doesn't, that people will feel uh, uh, that Allah is uh, not uh, or he's gender neutral. In Arabic, it will not happen because Allah is a, a male name. But I assume in English, when you read it and you don't know if Allah is a male or a female, uh, and it's short, so it could have, but it's a very interesting, this is, goes back to um, uh, Nazli's uh, question about how different people in different languages are receiving this having to do I, I want to bring another example with languages because i did keep like very few sentences in the novel uh, in the short uh, segments of the novel in hebrew and i did not translate them um and there was a purpose for that a lot many different reasons including uh i wanted people who don't speak the language in arabic also to hear the music to, to, to hear also sometimes what Palestinians in Israel go through, sometimes the alienation, sometimes all these different, and people did react. Some people were like, oh, why? Uh, there were so many, like some one person said, there's so many uh, uh, Hebrew in it. And it's not true. If you put the sentences together, maybe it's only one page maximum, if, if you, and even maybe less. Um, but it's interesting how people receive things uh, and which impressions uh, it, uh, uh, yeah. And, and there is something, two, two, two very short points to things we said before, to what uh, Azarin was saying, and uh, maybe you want to finish your point that you were making before. There is also, and Hillary also said, 
talked about a little bit. There's something about these novels that many people don't want to talk about, I think, and specifically about literature that deals with the issue of the Nakba, but not only what happened in 48, but, uh, but what happened later. And the fact that the, 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 the question of Palestine did not start in 67, that the issue started before. And this novel brings, and for me, it just brings all th this just there and tell people deal with it, live with it. But this is what I, as a Palestinian writer, want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And back to the translation, uh, the issue of translation, I think there it's really a lot of translator. They don't get, um, especially this translate from uh, languages from our regions, from the Middle East and other, they don't get enough credit. Of course, financial, forget about it usually very but also a lot of times it's their personal um uh, struggle to even market the books to convince uh, even if they are very well known uh, uh, uh translators it is not easy uh thing and really shampoo not only to sinan i don't know if he's still here i can't but also for a lot of people who translate arabic literature and iranian uh, literature and many other uh, languages into English, uh, and they don't get a lot of time rec enough recognition, and that's really sad. Thank you, Ibtisam. I'll try to pick up where I left off, but I don't know how how well my internet to do. It's been weak with internet, but I actually leading into this question of the Nakba and like uh, um, Elias's Elias Hoy's term of the ongoing Nakba uh, Palestine and uh, just the general sense of what I was saying about people viewing issues in Palestine and the Middle East as very, a very ahistorical perspective, right? Like it's always just this moment and um, being unable to trace it back. And, and therefore when, you know, writers from the region like you or Sanan or I speak up and we write about these things, I think we encounter like a kind of toxic disbelief from certain people. And I was wondering, um, you talked a lot about how literature can transform the reader, right? Because it can get under our skin. And I go back and forth to thinking that literature is um, sort of can, can transform the the writer can it be healing can it not often i'm not even sure but i i was just wondering what you think like the act of actually saying these are the memories and these memories have truth value um and this is the story of the nakba and this is where it began and how it's still unfolding was it empowering for you to write um and was it transformative for you and if so like, how did it change your relationship to the different kinds of exile that you have to navigate every day? Yeah, that's a, that's a difficult question because uh, I, I think I go back and forth with the answer uh, in the sense, um, yes, it, it has something that um, transformative, but it is also... Um, like for me, it is really um, important also to try uh, to enjoy the process of writing, although it is not an easy process and it's really, especially creative writing. Uh, but uh, for me, creative writing, uh, in opposed to my journalistic writing, which has to do with a lot of, um, facts and i mean of course literature has to do also with facts i do read a lot of history i do read socioeconomic uh, theory etc so it's not that literature doesn't deal with facts no but i have more freedom with literature i can be and do uh whatever i want i i, I personally i find um freedom in literature uh, in a way that I can't find anywhere else in anything. Uh, and that's, uh, yeah, that's for me um, uh, something that, um, yeah, uh, amazing uh, and um, means a lot to me. Mm -hmm. 
So this, when, when I am working a lot or when my job uh, and writing about the UN and politics, there are some days where I, at the end of the day, I think, what, do I, what am I doing? <laughs> doing here why I am not writing going back to my uh, short stories or novel or whatever so yeah there is something there is a sense of freedom that I find in uh, creative writing that I can't find anywhere else thank you Ibtisam Atalia also has a question uh, we do have time for yeah. it so yeah. um, let's hear it Thank you so much. I have um, two questions. Um, I'll say I'll state them very briefly. Uh, the first goes to um, kind of the point that one of the um, the important threads in the novel that uh, Hillary picked up on, and kind of cap she captured it was the concept of the disenfranchised grief um, uh, that um, Palestinians experience, and that is really kind of conveyed through. Um, um, to um, kind of the um, the plot and the characters, and um, I was thinking also related to this of the uh, the, the the point about how Allah is so uh, invisibilized, um, and on the one hand, and on the other hand, you as a Palestinian writer, in w within that the context of your of your novel, <laughs> um, you kind of have such an intimate knowledge of the Israelis, uh, mm -hmm. the Israeli Jews. Um, and so you know how to, I mean, Hillary said, you talked about Ariel as, you know, he considered himself leftist. So, uh, so I, I just want to invite you to speak about that um, kind of uh, um, that this notion of intimacy, um, kind of the intimate knowledge uh, that is, of course, very familiar within um, kind of colonial literature and <laughs> poetry. And so, so, th so this is one question. Uh, the second question, I think it goes back to um, Nazli's point about um, uh, state violence and how it relates to gender violence, because throughout the novel, um, I, um, um, th there is a motif of sexual violence. Uh, so I, I just also wanted to invite you to kind of talk about that, how state violence is also sexual and gender violence and how it plays out and to what degree it kind of went into your thinking as you wrote the novel. No, that's... Um, um, so... The issue of the intimate knowledge uh, and also how do you write about it or I lived in, I left Jerusalem, I mean after I finished, I, I, I was born and grew up in Taibe, which is north of Jaffa, about 40 kilometers, and then um, lived in Jerusalem for three or three and a half years. Uh, and I lived, I think I was maybe 22 or something, around 22, and when I left to Europe. By that time, I was active actually from a very young age in uh, different uh, like groups, including uh, um, campus, which is a student group at the Hebrew University, leftists like um, uh, between Palestinians and Israelis and uh, citizens of Israel. Uh, that was, they have a different approach, but before that, uh, many uh, meetings through my school with other Jewish uh, schools in Israel. What was uh, interesting for me again and again, and I have maybe to, to explain to people who don't know maybe these details, that uh, in Israel, um, mostly, not always, but the majority of schools are um, separated. There are Arab schools and Jewish schools the education system is the same. So Palestinians in Israel has to learn uh, the, um, uh, it's an Israeli education system. In other words, what we learned our school is uh, what the Israeli government decide, which history. Of course, we didn't learn about the Nakba. Uh, uh, and what we learned was uh, about the independence of the state of Israel and uh, a land without uh, people and all these uh, things. And even about um, uh, Sfaradi Jews, uh, uh, Arab Jews, Oriental Jews, uh, we didn't learn much. Most of the history we learned was about the Ashkenazi, uh, uh, Jewish history. Uh, and that's also a, another uh, interesting uh, issue and uh, 
things that need to be to take to be taken into consideration. El Ashohat has a very uh, the scholar uh, at NYU. She has a very um, uh, uh, an essay. Uh, I'm not sure if I get the title right, but I think uh, Zionism from the perspective of its uh, Jewish uh, victim. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, and it's it's important to read and to 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 take this whole issue also into, into another dimension. And one thing that struck me about and going back to your grief question and uh, the intimate knowledge in a very young age that many people when they when we were talking to uh, who came to meet Palestinians or Arab citizens of Israel, they had good intentions if you want, but they never wanted to talk about the Nakba. And that was always an issue between uh, many of us uh, and them. Uh, and, uh, and then, uh, and with time, I was like frustrated also with it. Uh, and then uh, studying at the Hebrew University also opened, opened my eyes to a lot of other uh, things and Jerusalem as such also if you look at the people in Jerusalem the way they are marginalized the way they it's un, it's it's things that you don't hear about in in, in daily life in in news um, and um, the gender violence thing yes it it is a very you know the thing is sometimes as a woman, as a feminist, as a Palestinian woman, as all these issues. Um, in my work, in my novels, I do talk about these, uh, the problems within the Palestinian society also. Uh, the, the gender violence, of course, that the state of Israel also use in order to uh, um, not only separate, but to roll, to, 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 to make the occupation more, um, um, the, the violence, it's like, uh, I will give you an example, maybe that's easier. Uh, I, first of all, yes, there is one story in, in the novel that the story about the rape. There, the, the, it's a very short one. The violence is very, uh, and I decided to bring that to, to the novel or to put it in the novel because uh, there are rape cases. Uh, women, Palestinian women were raped in 48 by Zionist groups that historically it was talking about, is proven, there are cases, etc. It struck me a lot of times that the, the subject doesn't come up that often even within the Palestinian, uh, even within uh, the Palestinian society. It is something that we don't want often to talk about for a lot of many reasons. So, um, but also I, talking, going back to the issue of uh, leaving, uh, going through airports, I, when I was like the first time I think I left the country, I was maybe 20 or 19 just for a visit to Europe. And the, the gender issue sometimes crystallizes itself in a very small things. And I remember they ask you, you know, we, we know, who, who, they ask you, okay, where are you going? What do you want to do, etc. And I had a boyfriend back then that I was visiting. And they did, they had, I mean, it was like, a, I'm leaving, I'm just going, I'm going as a tourist to Europe. And they asked me, oh, uh, does your family know that you have a boyfriend? So this is the gender violence. They, so it's, it's in everyday life. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a very um, simple uh, example. And there is, of course, what prisoners uh, go through, women, the torture, the etc. Uh, women prisoners, and men also. Uh, so, so, so it is used as uh, a way to control uh, people under occupation and colonization. 
as a tool. Thank you, Thank you Ibtisam. Um, I do also believe that that scene is particularly very strong. And I hope everybody gets to read the novel, uh, if they haven't, um, as soon as possible, because it's really strong. And unfortunately, we've come to the end of our talk. It was a really lively discussion, um, the best that I've attended on Zoom so far. Thank you so much, all. Ibtisam, Hilary, Azarin, Elisa, Natalia, Mary, and I would like to announce that uh, in November, we will be featuring Sinan Antin, who is uh, here in this chat with us and who is the translator of this novel. Um, and we will be sending out details um, for RSVP soon. So uh, watch, um, watch out for this email. And thank you all so much for attending. It's really important um, to us as Middle Eastern um, writers and um, people that you are here to support us. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.